Exodus chapter 17, I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. Please listen carefully, for this is God's word. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and cap, camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it, why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people, and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you strike the river, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, and that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of that place Massah and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? So this is the third time the people were grumbling, complaining against uh, Moses. And actually when they complained against Moses, they complained against the Lord. But now the, notice that the rhetoric is growing stronger and stronger here and more threatening. And what they're doing, I don't think they even realize what they're doing. I don't think many of us don't realize what we're doing. But when they're grumbling in this situation, they're, they're questioning God's providence. And that's what we do. I know I do. We question God's providence. Why is this happening to me? What have you done? Why aren't you meeting my desires, my prayer requests, like I'm praying them, Lord? Why is it getting so hard in this wilderness, in this world that I'm living in? Why aren't things just falling into place? I thought that when I accepted you as Savior, everything would just fall into place. But it seems like everything's going haywire. <coughs> That's what they're doing. And having, but notice that they have already experienced God's blessing and favors through the deliverance from Egypt. And this is what's important here. Because God has just delivered them from Egypt. And that is a picture, like I've said before, deliverance of us out of this world. Deliverance of us out of the bondage of Satan. Taking us out of the kingdom of Satan and places us in the kingdom of Christ. It's a picture of redemption here. But now, they are guilty, we all are, of a lack of faith and ingratitude. And that's huge. You know, the trials and the tribulations that the people are experiencing in the wilderness on their way to the promised land was intended to test their faith. But more than that, it's intended to grow their faith, to strengthen their faith. Uh, it's one thing to live out Exodus 14.31, and I'm going to read that really fast. In Exodus 14.31, remember it says, Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord, and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. You see, like Pharaoh before them, though, they're acting more like Pharaoh now. They're acting more like the world. Because how many times must they, and this is what you think, when you read through this, the thoughts that go through my mind is how many times do these people need to see God work before they understand and acknowledge that the Lord has their best interests in mind. And that's what's crucial here. That is what is the most important thing here. The Lord always has your best interests in mind, no matter what your circumstance, what you're going through. I have to live this out now. I see people like Sylvia. I see people that, that have got Kenny right now going through massive, massive uh, hard circumstances, and they're living out their faith. Now I have to do it, don't I? Now I have to drive to Beaverton, be with my mom, who's probably going to be blind. And what do I say to my mom when I get there? You know, and, and, and if I'm going to live what I'm preaching here, on my way home, on, on my way back to Beaverton, I'm going to have to be praising the Lord. Now doesn't that sound ridiculous? But we'll get to that in a minute. 
you know, uh, it, it's the difference between gratitude and ingratitude. And that's what drives a relationship. Uh, we should always thank the Lord, first and foremost, for delivering us from Egypt, from delivering us from the bondage of Satan. And, and this is what's crucial here. When we, we're human, and once again, we're born again, we have the Holy Spirit in us, we have to work with the Holy Spirit. It's a 50-50 corporation, that's what you call sanctification. You have to work with the Holy Spirit in order to grow in the faith, but we also battle that sin nature. And we're going to battle that the rest of our lives. So being human, we get into these hard circumstances, and what's our first expression? Why is this happening to me? Why are you allowing this to happen, Lord? That's important. Why are you, Lord, allowing this to happen? And what ends up happening is we don't praise the Lord at that moment. And so what we have to do, what I'm going to do from now on when hard circumstances come up, and my first reaction might be to question God, why are you allowing this in my life? Or why is this happening to me? What I'm going to do is remember back to him delivering me from sin. Saving me. Saving me, keeping me, and eventually I'm going to be in heaven with him, with, the, with my loved ones, with the people of God for eternity. If I can't think of anything else, I'm going to remember that. And that's what they should have done. They've complained three times now. They've complained three times in a rapid succession. It, 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 like one after another. When we feel, we see, and all of us in this room, all of us that are in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the Lord knows how you feel. He does. And you love him. You love him. And he knows that. And that's why he doesn't, he doesn't get, I guess to use human language, he doesn't get upset. And say, well, Charlie, you should have been uh, thanking me more. I'm going to boop you out. Like, he doesn't do that. He's very gentle and patient with us because he wants us to grow in the faith. So what happens is he knows what's in our heart. He knows that we love him, even though we might complain at times. But what he wants is us to express that to him. And the only way I can, I can express this would be prayer. He already knows what we, we're going to ask, right? He knows the thoughts before they even come into our minds, what it says in Jeremiah. So he knows what you want, but he wants you to express that in prayer. Not for his benefit, but for our benefit. And I think it's the same way with gratitude, just being thankful. We have it in our heart. He knows that. But we have to express it to him. He wants us to express it to him. And you know what I think? One reason why he wants us to do that, remember, it's not for God. It's for us. It's because we get into that habit. So when I'm driving to Beaverton tonight, I'll be praising the Lord. What do I think when I'm praising the Lord? Well, thank you, Lord, that my mom knows you in a personal relationship, number one. And we should always be thankful for that. Thank you, Lord, as Mike said, that I have another chance to go see my mom. Thank you, Lord, that even though both our lives are going to change, it's going to be for good because you only have my best interest in heart. And most of all, you have my mom's best interest. And it's hard for us to realize that. But look what happens uh, otherwise when we don't express that gratitude verbally to the Lord. Sometimes he begins to think it as rejection. When it, 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 I mentioned this last week, but if, well, I use my mom for example. My mom's done a, she's a mother. And she loved being a mother. She just loved, loved that. And she did a lot. For me and my two brothers, as she grew up, she just loved being a mother. And we took it just ingratitude. You know, we were 13 at one time. We just took it as ingratitude. <laughs> but, you know, she knows how I feel. But sometimes, and maybe my mom's a wrong example, but another person, uh, sometimes when you, we don't express that gratitude to them, they can view it as rejection. They can be viewed as ingratitude when we don't express that to them. So it's important. So I think well, if we get into that habit of expressing our gratitude, our thankfulness to the Lord every day before you even understand why this is happening, understand he's got your best interests at heart. Thank you, Lord. You're going to reveal it to me eventually. I'm going to trust you. 
what happens is that we end up doing it to other people in our life. It becomes a habit. That might be one reason why the Lord wants us to show up thankfulness and gratitude. But in verse 2, what happens here is it says, Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And that word for contend, this is a really good translation here in the New King James. Uh, what the, it's a change of the Hebrew word here. And he's going to use that word throughout 17. But before the other two times they complained, it was a softer word in the Hebrew. Now they're changing. The word's been changed. And the word literally means to contend with, to quarrel with. Uh, it, it means to uh, a judgment in a legal case. Contend with a person in a legal case. This is, and this is important because what's happening here, remember, it's another legal term that's being used here. I think, personally, the first two times that they uh, complained, the Lord is really gentle with them. And, he, and he, he's exercising through that relationship with them, uh, putting in their heart, you need to understand, you need to repent, you need to understand who I am, I'm doing this in your life so that you grow deeper with me, on and on. But they continue to complain. And now this is the third time in a rapid succession, a really close time frame, that they've complained again three different times, three different circumstances. And now the words change to a judicial case, a contention within a legal form. And the only thing I can think of is now it's God, now God's going to take action. And you see, and that's what he does with us. Remember, justification is a legal term in the Greek. And what it, it's a picture of Christ. We're standing in a courtroom, and, and we're trusting what Christ has done for us, his sinless life, his righteousness. That's what saves us. And it's as if the Father bangs down the gavel and says, Roy, you are saved because of what my son has done for you. It's a judicial uh, rendering. And I think now this is a judicial rendering because what's happened here is God, and most of these people were saved, but for the, especially for the believers, they cross that line and they're making it a lifestyle. And it's the third time that they've complained. Now God's going to take action here. And that's what he does with us. He doesn't want us to form a habitual lifestyle in sin. That's the difference between a believer and a non-believer. Remember I told you about the pesky participles <coughs> And especially in 1 Corinthians 6, when Paul describes uh, adulterers, fornicators, on and drunkards, just on and off the list. And it's all participles. It means it's, 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 a, a, a per se, it's a lifestyle that you're committing. And then what does Paul say? Such were some of you, but you were washed, sanctified, glorified, justified. And so what he does is that's the difference between a believer and a non-believer. He breaks that bondage of sin. You don't live that lifestyle of sin anymore. And whenever you start going down, starting a pattern of sin in your life, and you're his, he's going to break in there. And he's going to do something to break you from that pattern. And that's what's happening here. Actually, and so when you read like verse 3 and 4, it's illustrating a very serious situation here where some people are revealing a very ugly, explosive mood that's on the verge of breaking out into a riot. Okay, so that word that's being used now is a really serious word. It's contention within a, in a judicial se uh, sentence. And, you know, but look what the Lord does. He doesn't become angry with Moses. He's patient with them, and he's patient with the people still, but he's going to take action. Uh, is, he, what does he say to Moses cries out to the Lord, saying, what shall I do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And what's the Lord's response? In verse 5, and the Lord said to Moses, he didn't yell at him. He said, okay, Moses, go on before the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, also take in your hand the rod with which you struck the river and go. And behold, I will stand there with you there on the rock in Hor, and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. Now that's huge. So once again, the Lord is giving them their desire. 
but something serious is happening here. And you, you'll see that if you go through the rest of the books, especially when you get to numbers 13 and 14, which we'll get to in a minute. But some of these people have crossed over the line. And, uh, but the water from the rock is another Exodus-like event. Remember in the, during the plagues when they, they hit the rock? Or the, the, Moses took his staff and hit the water and the waters turned to blood? Now he's saying, take that same rod that, I, that you did in Egypt and strike the water. But this time, water is going to come out. And, and what the Lord is saying is the same power, now this is important, the same power that has brought the Israelites out of Egypt is the same power that's sustaining them in the desert and that will bring them eventually to the promised land. It's the same power. That's why if you can't think of anything to praise the Lord about when you're going through a hard circumstance, start with thank you for saving me. Because that's what's happening here. It's the same power that delivered us from sin. It's the same power that's working in your life every day to keep you safe from Satan, keep you safe from falling away, and eventually you're going to end up in, in heaven. The desert is a hostile place, as was Egypt. But notice, but both are under God's providence. And providence is a heavy-duty topic, but God's in control of it all, of his providence. And so what happens is believers and non-believers go through the same type of hard circumstances. They do. And misfortune. Nobody's excluded. Because we live in the same cursed world. But what's the difference? And this is what I keep thinking about as I get prepared for the next week. I keep thinking of some of you in this congregation. I think about this. Christians go through dire straits with faith. Just like Vivian Ann, when she had the open heart surgery, she goes through dire circumstances with faith. And yet, non-believers, what happens to them? They become more hard. Unless the Holy Spirit's working in their heart, we don't know who the Holy Spirit's working in, softening their heart, using that as a catapult to bring them to faith. We don't know that. Just like Moses didn't understand what danger he was in. Because he can't see their heart when he said they're complaining. Oh, to Moses' perception, Moses, they were complaining as they did before. Okay? But he didn't realize how, how in much danger he was actually in, but the Lord did. And they, because they used this certain word. The Lord knew the danger Moses was in. And, 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 and Moses actually said, well, they're getting ready to stone me. But the Lord said, it's okay, Moses. I'm here. Just <laughs> go do this. Give them their desire. And that's what he does with each one of us. We don't know what's in the other person's heart that might want to do you harm, but the Lord knows. And he will place your, his hedge around you. And make no mistake about it, you're not leaving here to be with the Lord until your time's up. So everything that happens to you on this earth, I've learned that about death. We cannot control death at all. It's his timing. But until that timing comes, beloved, he's going to be working in your life, even though it may, may seem like horrible, hard circumstances, to prune you and mold you for what he wants to do with you a week from now, a month from now, two years from now. We don't see the whole big picture, but God does. And that's why he's so patient with his people. Uh, he knows the, 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 the future. We don't. The Lord, as I mentioned before, has the full picture in mind of what he's going to do with your life. When you're going to go home to be with him. What you're going to be doing tomorrow, next week, a year from now. And his promises will never be thwarted by anyone, including yourself. And that, beloved, is what we read with Stanley. That's what he was saying last Wednesday. He keeps his people on track. Whatever that takes. He, he's going to keep you right on track to accomplish his purposes. And we must remember that their relationship here, and if you want to get technical, our relationship, is still in its infancy. Especially when you compare it to eternity. And God knows what he's preparing you for. He knows what he's preparing Eda for, Brenda for. He knows what he's preparing you for. And that's why you have to go through what you go through. And he wants you, he gets you to the place 
He literally gets you to the place where your only recourse is to trust him completely. That's the hardest thing a human being can do. Matter of fact, we can't do it without the Holy Spirit. We can't do it, but that's the goal of everything he does in your life. And if he has to put you up against a circumstance where you see no way out, praise the Lord. Because that means you're right in his hand and he's revealing your hidden self to you at a deeper level. And you're going to come through that circumstance on the other end and you're going to know him at a deeper, more intimate level. And he wants you to have the habit of just trusting him completely. I think we talked yesterday about certain religions out there that say, they, they come out and say, well, for, number one, we don't believe Jesus is God, that he's an example. So we have to do, it's our works that save us. We have to do something. We have to go door to door. That's part of it. We have to do this, this, this. They'll tell you that. And so what are they saying, though? What are they saying? They're saying we're not completely trusting Christ for salvation. We take it for granted at times because we do it. And you don't want to be prideful. Understand it's the Holy Spirit working in you to get you to that point where you just trust Christ. So sometimes I walk out there. Sometimes I go out there and I meet people and I think to myself, how hard is it? Just this is a get free card. Just trust Christ completely and you're going to heaven. And we don't see people doing it. Because it's human nature not to give yourself over to somebody completely. If you always have to be in control, even if it's 99% God, 1% you, you have to do something. That's what you're saying, and that's what you're saying to the Lord. But as Christians, it's 100% completely trusting in Christ alone, and that's precious in His sight. You see, the Lord's testing His people in the desert. He's testing us in our desert, in the world that we live in now, the same cursed world. But that word test may conjure up in our minds images of pop quizzes or IRS audits, but it's not what the concept means theologically. The Lord's not a professor looking to fail his people at the first wrong answer. Okay? He is not placing them in an unbearable situation just looking for an excuse to do them in. Now I got it. I knew if I just put you in this hard circumstance, you're going to fail, and now I can get me. He's not that kind of God. He's not. And now this, if you get anything from this, you get what I'm going to say next. Just remember this. It's the bottom of page three on the notes. It's not that the Israelites are now good enough because they passed these tests to be worthy of God's attention. God tests his people for our benefit not for his own. Okay? We never, if, if Cliff is going through one test after another and passing these tests, and, and then he says, wow, now I'm really worthy of God's attention. You see, that's what all, I'm going to say, every religion outside of Christianity, that's what they're saying. They don't realize they're saying that. If I just add something to my faith, if I just do some good works, now I'm worthy to go to heaven. That's what they're saying. It's through passing and failing these tests that God, God's people learn the nature of obedience and what pleases God. That's why he puts us through these tests. <coughs> the Lord wants to produce in his people a more intimate relationship so that they will better understand what it means to trust him daily, completely. That's why he doesn't respond to their complaint <coughs> with fire. He, he never does. He will soon. We're going to get to that in a second, real fast. But he, he gives, he, what does he do? He gives them the water. Okay, Moses, strike the rock, I'll give them the water. He responds to their complaint, not with fire, but with gracious provision of water and food. That's how much he loves his people. The desert is the place where God's love is the focus. Our world, when you're traveling through this world, our focus should be on God's love in this world. You know, uh, I'm going to read three of these verses really fast to conclude. Because this is what it, 
they write about their desert experiences. But listen to how these verses here uh, describe God's love for his people. In Deuteronomy 131, it says, In the wilderness, where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. In this world, where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, Irma, as a man carries his son all the way until you came to heaven. That's what he's doing with us. You go to Hosea 2.14. In Hosea 2.14 it says, Therefore, behold, I will lure her, will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. That's a description of a husband for his bride. It's a description of Jesus Christ in each one of us were his bride. One more, Nehemiah 9.21. In Nehemiah 9.21 it says, Forty years... You sustain them in the wilderness. They lack nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. Eighty years the Lord sustained Teresa in this world. She lacked nothing. He always met her needs. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. That's our God. We're in this world. And all I'm going to say is, is uh, this is why, when I just thought about this, I think this morning, when I keep thinking to myself, the day I pass on and be with the Lord, I'm going to think to myself, I wish I would have done things a little bit differently. I wish I would have cherished more in this world, because our relationship, when we die, is going to be changed eternally, completely. But in this world, we have to battle sin. And in this world, we're experiencing God in a way that's deeper than we're going to experience than we can imagine right now. And there's a reason, a purpose behind that. When we get to heaven, and we're not gonna, our minds aren't going to be a, 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 a clean slate. And we're not going to wake up in heaven and have no memories of this world. The difference is, and this is hard, I don't know what kind of memories we're going to have in this world. I'm willing to say all of them, bad and good. And I'll tell you why. We may see some of our loved ones not go to heaven. Then we're going to want That's going to make us sad, isn't it? But once again, it's only my opinion. I cling to the last verse in Isaiah. The very last verse of Isaiah. And when we get to heaven, we're going to have, we're going to see things without sin, without any sin environment. We're going to see things through God's eyes. And that's why I believe we're going to have the memories on this earth. So everything you do in this life, there's a purpose and reason behind it. It's a lack of trust that God deems as rejection. Now remember, this same group here, when you go to Numbers 13 and 14, remember what happened. They came and they, and they sent Joshua, Caleb, and what it was, 70 others, or how many of them were, to go into the promised land and tell us if we can take it. And, and they came back, and, and Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that said, yes, we can take it. The Lord, he says in, in Numbers 14, 9, the Lord is with us. We can take the promised land. But Israel refused to trust God. Remember that? And they didn't enter the promised land. And, and it's like, that's the key word, the Lord is with us. No matter what you're going through in this life, always understand the Lord is with me. And he wants to show me something in here. I know at the end of this hard circumstance, I'm going to come out the other end. I'm going to know Christ even more at a deeper level. Because in the end, lack of trust is disobedience. And that's what he wants to wean us from. 